your bulletin and turn there and follow along with the outline of the message that's there today. And while you're doing that, we just want to share that our church extends our sympathy to uh, Red Atkinson and his family as his daughter uh, passed this uh, week in Ohio and our thoughts and prayers with them and also to Rita Wilson as her mother. Uh, the services were last week and her mother passed away and so our thoughts and prayers are with both families um, this week. Today as we continue in our Christmas series of messages, uh, I'm reminded of the joke of a mother who had three sons and the three sons each grew up to become very successful. They were millionaires uh, several times over and as brothers though, they were still very competitive. Any of y'all got kids that are real competitive and, and these brothers were always trying to outdo each other when it came to gift buying. So they would spare no expense to give their mom the best gift, whether it was Christmas or her birthday or any other uh, gift buying occasion. So one, one year for Christmas, the first son, he purchased his mom a new home. And uh, he sent her a, a package that had a set of keys in it, had a picture of the home, and said, Mom, I know you've always lived in that small, so simple, modest home, and I want you to live in the home of your dreams. And he said, here's a picture of it. Uh, it's ready to move in when you're ready. Well, the second son had a brand new Mercedes delivered to his mom's house. And uh, he had the keys sent to her and said, Mom, I want you to ride in style. You deserve to have all the comforts you can have. Well, then the third son, he thought, I've got to do something really special. So he knew that his mom liked to read the Bible. She'd read the Bible every day for most of, his, of, of her life. And, but her eyesight had gotten so bad in recent years, she was no longer able to read the scriptures. So he got on the Internet, and he found out about this rare, I mean, just this parrot that had been trained. It had memorized the entire Bible, okay? Someone had trained this parrot. And you could literally just quote a book from the Bible, a chapter and a verse, and that parrot would just say it right to you. And he thought, this is perfect. She lives alone. This parrot will be great company for her. And she can't read the Bible anymore, so the parrot can just quote her whatever chapter or verse she wants, and that'll be awesome. So he had the parrot shipped to her house. Well, the day after Christmas, the mother called each of her sons, and she told the first son, she said, listen, I really appreciate that house but listen, I'm just a simple lady. That house is way too big. I only live in like three rooms of my house now. And I just wouldn't want to pay the utility bills for a house like that. And it's just way too expensive. I can only imagine what the taxes on a house like that would be. You just sell that house and you take that money back. I'd rather you have it. And so she told her second son, I really appreciate that car. It is, I'm sure it's beautiful, but with my eyes so bad, I just can't drive anymore. And I don't know what all those buttons and gadgets on that thing do anyway. And it's just way too complicated for me. You take that car and sell it and you get your money back. But I appreciate the thought. Then she told her third son, said, listen, you got the good sense to know what your mother likes. And said, thank you, that chicken was delicious. And so maybe... I don't know what gifts you have for the special someone in your life, but just be careful when you have them delivered like that. So today we continue our series of messages entitled Journey to Christmas. And in week one, we looked at Christmas through the eyes of the wise men who uh, saw the star, followed the star, which led them to the truth about Christmas, and they were able to worship at the, the feet of Jesus. And then last week, we looked at Christmas through the eyes of King Herod who was not excited about Christmas. As a matter of fact, everything that Christmas stood for, he was against it, and he worked to undo the plan of God. But we saw last week that when God has a sovereign plan, there is nothing of this earth that can stop the purposes and the plans of God. And so God intervened, and God is going to intervene in this world that we live in today. Uh, today we're going to look at the birth of Christ through a different set of eyes, and that of the shepherds. Um, and if you have your Bible with you this morning, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to start with verse 8. Now, if you're able, would you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God as we show respect for the Word of God together today? It says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. 
And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Thank you. You may be seated and may God bless the reading of his word. If you stop and you think about uh, the people that God chose to involve in the birth of his son, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a strange uh, assortment of people. Two weeks ago, we talked about how he put a special star in the sky to mark the, the fulfillment of the times and the birth of his son, and that star guided these wise men, and we dug a little deeper and found out that basically these wise men are pagan mystics. I mean, these were not people you would think of at being at, at there to, for, to mark the birth of the Savior of mankind. Uh, they came from a pagan culture, a pagan religion, but they followed the star and they discovered the King of Kings at the end of the trail. They came to worship and offer gifts. Then we see that the only other invited guests, the only other recorded human witnesses at the night of his birth were a group of shepherds from the fields. The angels delivered this great news to the shepherds, and today we, we kind of have a glorified version of, of shepherds. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you all have probably at some point either been in a, a living nativity scene or maybe in a church Christmas play, and you've donned the old bathrobe, right, and you've put the garb on your head with the little band around it, and you got the little shepherd staff, and we all love the shepherds. They're just kind of cute and lovable, especially when the little kids play the shepherds and they come up there with their robe dragging the ground and all that. And we think, oh, shepherds, right? But if you go back to the historical reality of it in the first century, I don't think many people thought shepherds were cute or, or noteworthy. They slept outside in the fields with their animals. Likely, as you would imagine, probably didn't smell the best, weren't always looking their best. However, they were the first invited guests to visit the Messiah when he was born. The son of God, the savior, savior of humanity, and the invited guests were shepherds. Shepherds. So this has led me to wonder, why were they the first invited guests? Why, out of all the people that could have been invited to witness the birth of Jesus, why shepherds? It's amazing that it was shepherds and not kings, not celebrities, not the rich, not the social elites. But shepherds, I don't believe that God does anything haphazardly. I, I don't believe that God was sitting in heaven and went, oh shoot, we forgot to invite anybody. Who's available? Um, go with the shepherds, just go with them. I don't think that's the way it went down. Everything God does has a purpose and a reason and a plan. So why shepherds? I'm confident he had his reasons, and I can't be sure what they are. But as I've thought about it this week, here are just a few things that I think God was probably trying to show the world by inviting the shepherds to be there. First of all, Jesus came to be the good shepherd. Even though shepherds might not have ranked high on the social class system of the, of the first century, um, they were often overlooked, they were often outcast in society, but the Bible consistently speaks of shepherding as a high calling as a noble task. It's a term that's often used to describe the heart of a leader. That if you were a leader, you were not to be lording over people, you were a shepherd of the people. And God speaks of that with high esteem. The prophet Isaiah described the shepherd that God would send to save his people when he said this in Isaiah 40. 
He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. You know, there's a lot of parallels between Jesus and, uh, and a shepherd. And it, you can go through the Bible. It's rich with analogies. For one, Jesus guided uh, his sheep in the best paths. In Psalm 23, often known as the shepherd's psalm, we read this in the first three verses. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. One of the things about a shepherd that's different from maybe a cattle rancher that we're more familiar with here in the United States, a cattle rancher will get back behind the herd and drive the herd to make them go in the direction that he wants them to go. But that wasn't the way that a shepherd moved the flock. A shepherd would spend much time with his sheep to the point where they became quite familiar with his voice. And then he would go out ahead of where he wanted them to go he would then call to the sheep and they would follow him. Much different. John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he hasn't already done. He has gone ahead of us. He has come and lived this life, been tempted and tried in every way that you and I will ever be tried. And he has modeled the way to live this life. Jesus doesn't force us to do anything. We have a choice in the matter whether we want to accept Jesus and make him the Lord of our life or whether we want to reject him for reasons I'll never understand. He doesn't force us. He invites us to follow him. Secondly, Jesus protected the sheep from danger just like a shepherd would. Psalm 23 goes on in verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. A good shepherd, if a, if a wild animal threatened the flock, a shepherd would quickly run and get between the threat and the flock. He would put his body and stand there with his staff and fight off whatever threat was, was uh, coming after his flock. And likewise, in the spiritual realm, when sin threatened God's children it threatened to separate us from the holiness of heaven from eternal life with God the Father the good shepherd came and got in between a holy God and a sinful people and he fought to, to make a bridge that we could be reunited for all eternity with God the Father now listen it cost him his life but today because of the good shepherd we have the hope of salvation John chapter 10 says this, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that's the, the story of Christmas I want you to hear today. Thirdly, he went searching for those who had gone astray. Mark 2 says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus said, I didn't come out to hang out just in the church and make people more holy, but I came to go to the dark places of this culture and find the people who weren't thinking about God, that aren't currently in a relationship with God, that weren't currently living a life that glorifies God. Those are the people that I came searching for. That's one of the things I love about Jesus. You know, uh, this Christmas, Christmas sin tends to draw people into the church that maybe aren't there a lot. And let me, let me speak to somebody who might be here today because of the season. First of all, I'm not heaping guilt on you because you're not here more often. I am delighted that you're here today. And I want you to know that this church family is delighted that you're here today. Jesus came looking for people that maybe weren't typically a part of the religious crowd. And he said, you have a place in my flock, in my family. Jesus sought out those who had gone astray. Maybe there's somebody here today that it's been a while since you've been in the Lord's house and you realize that maybe not everything in your life is exactly in the will of God like it should be. And there's some areas of your life that just aren't right. And I want to tell you today that God is not against you. God is for you. 
God is delighted that you are in his house today for whatever reasons brought you here because that is the heart of a shepherd. He goes looking for those who've gone astray, who maybe have made a mess of things, who maybe are not exactly where they should be, but he says, I, if you'll follow me, I'll guide you back to the right path. So I just don't think it's a coincidence that anybody's here today. God is always working, amen? God is always searching. The good shepherd is always looking for the one stray sheep that needs to get back with the flock and get back on the right path in life. I love that about Jesus. Second of all, I believe God invited shepherds because Jesus came to be the Lamb of God. It's appropriate for shepherds to witness the birth of a lamb. John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By sending angels to a, a group of shepherds in a field, I think this was God's way of letting everybody know this king is coming to be a different kind of king than what you're probably looking for. Don't go to the royal palace looking for this king. You go to a stable in a manger with peasant parents involved in this because this king is coming first to be a lamb. He's coming to be a humble type of lamb who will lay down his life. He wouldn't be a tyrannical leader who ruled by brute force. They had seen so many of those. He wasn't coming to be a Herod type who, who ruled and over the people through treachery and intimidation and murder. No, this, this ruler would be different. This ruler was going to be a lamb. You see, the first time Jesus came into this world, he came to be a sacrificial lamb who would offer himself as the sin payment for your sins and for mine. Many in his day failed to acknowledge him as the Messiah because they were looking for the lion. And he came to be the lamb the first time. Now make no mistake about it, he's coming again and oh, he'll be a lion. He will be roaring as the lion of the tribe of Judah and he will come as a conquering king and he will sit on the throne of David and he will rule from Jerusalem over a kingdom that will never end. But the first time he snuck into this world on that silent night, that holy night that we sang about today in just a, a discreet kind of way because he entered the first time as a lamb. If you think about it, it's appropriate that the lamb of God would be welcomed into the world by those who best knew how to handle and care for a lamb. And yet more than anybody, these shepherds also knew something else about a lamb. They knew that lambs that they cared for, most of them were born to die. Perhaps they attended some of the very lambs that would be sacrificed in the temple at Passover. If you think about it being in proximity to, to Jerusalem... There's a good chance that those lambs that were there made their way into the temple and were sacrificed. Or if that wasn't part of their fate, most of those lambs were, were born and were, were raised to provide sustenance for the people. They would end up providing a meal for someone. But they knew that the lambs that they spent so much time with were born with a purpose to die. I wonder if they realized that night that the baby that they were holding would be the lamb who would ultimately take away the sins of all who would look upon him for salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but watch this, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. I wonder if they knew that night that the baby that they were holding was the savior of mankind who would, he would be the one person in all of history who would never sin, who would always get it right and who could go to the cross as the only qualified person to lay down his life in exchange for the sins of the world. The one redeemer, the one person in all of history who had the blood of God flowing through his veins who could truly say, I offer you salvation. I wonder if they realized that the one they were holding would be their shepherd, would be their guide, would be their eternal comforter. Listen, he wasn't just the good shepherd back then. He wasn't just the lamb of God then. But it says in Revelation 7 that for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He is for all eternity. 
and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. If you, when you get to heaven, if you want to find Jesus, look for the shepherd. Look for the one shepherding the people. Look for the lamb who died to, to, to bring his people to himself. I can't say for sure, but I think God invited the shepherds because he wanted them to witness the birth of the real lamb. The real lamb of God. You know, a final thing that I love about the Christmas story is that God invited those shepherds because for most people, their intents and purposes, the shepherds didn't matter. They were kind of people in the background of life. They weren't important people that you needed to know if you wanted to advance in society. They're just people out living, camping out. Every day is a camp out, and they smelled like it probably. But they're on the outskirts of society looking in at real life in the cities. We can only speculate as to why God didn't alert the lead of that day that the Savior of the world was to be born that night. Perhaps the royals were just too sophisticated for such nonsense. Maybe the highly educated were just too dismissive of something that didn't have all the dots connected. Maybe the schedules of the popular and the well-connected were just too full to make time to venture out into a small town that nobody cared about to witness a baby born to two parents that not many people cared about. But a group of humble shepherds had the faith to look up to listen, and listen, to respond, to respond when they heard the call. You know, God just seems to have a track record, if you read the Bible, for seemingly using unlikely people to do the most amazing things. All throughout the Bible, you, it just, it's God's story of saying, I can do anything I want through anybody I want to accomplish my purposes. God spoke through a donkey to talk some sense into Balaam. He can use anybody. God used a stuttering murderer named Moses to lead the Hebrew children out of Egyptian slavery. God chose a young boy with a slingshot to take down a giant to show that the power wasn't in the soldier, but it was in the God that was in the soldier. God used a prostitute named Rahab to deliver the Israelite spies. Jesus chose a group of fishermen, tax collectors, and zealots to be his disciples and to change the world. Jesus took a little boy's lunch of five loaves and two fish, and he fed over 5,000 people. God, or Jesus took a, a disciple who had denied Jesus three times and led him to preach the most important sermon at Pentecost that would launch the church as the Holy Spirit was poured out to those that were there. God converted a man who used to kill Christians to become one of the first missionaries and to write much of the New Testament that we have today. God can use anybody for his purposes just to show that he's the one doing it. And that's the story of Christmas. And so I'm saying to you today, if you've ever felt unworthy, if you've ever felt unqualified to be used by God, if you've ever thought that Christmas story is for all those church people, but it's not for somebody like me, if you've ever thought that you had nothing to offer, if you've ever thought that the work of the kingdom of God was for other people who had gifts and talents that you just don't have, listen to me, understand this, you're just the type of person that God's looking for. Because he loves people that are humble and think nothing of themselves apart from Christ. But realize that with Christ, with the Spirit of God living in me, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and he used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. I love that. God loves to just take the things that we think are so important and the things that we think we can't do, and he goes, watch this. And he just flips it. God says things like the first shall be last, and the last will be first in my kingdom. God loves to turn the priorities and the values and the status of this world on its ear just to show us what he's all about and what he can do. God often chooses to use common, ordinary people to do his best work. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I like this one too. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Listen, we're those jars of clay. There is nothing special about me. There's nothing special about you or any of us. But listen, you put the Spirit of God in us, and all of a sudden, anything is possible. 
This, there's nothing special about this church, this, this community, but you let the Spirit of God loose in this church, and you invite Him into your home, into your marriage, into the situations of your life, anything is possible. We are jars of clay, but listen, if you will invite the, the Lord of Christmas, the Lord of the cross, and the Lord of eternity into your life, then listen, anything can happen. Anything. Because the power of the gospel doesn't rest in, in my ability to present it to you in a clever way that's, that's entertaining or profound. Listen, I found liberty in that. All I need to do is to stand up here and tell you what the word of God says and the spirit of God does the work. I'm just a jar of, of clay, just a simple messenger and that's been liberating to me. I just need to show up and let God bring the victory. The power of the acts of service that we do for others, it doesn't rest in the amount of money that we spend on somebody or the novelty or the thoughtfulness of the idea that we come up with to bless somebody. But if it's done with the heart of love and the right spirit, that we let the love of God flow through us to other people, then it'll be powerful. It'll be profound because God works through jars of clay. The power of the songs that we sing and worship, it doesn't come from, from a staging or a presentation or how we present it. Listen, it comes from the heart of the worshiper that says, God, everything that I am is because of you, and I pour myself out to you, and we can make the most beautiful noise, but if it doesn't come from a heart that is surrendered, it's noise in God's ears. But listen, if we come, and it sounds awful in the ears of man, but we come with sincere hearts that really want to glorify him and have surrendered our lives to him, God leans forward and says, that is absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful. It's all in the spirit of God. It's not about us. We're just human vessels. We're just jars of clay. And so, of course, the shepherds would be there. Of course the people that were overlooked by society would be there to witness the birth of this lamb, this shepherd, this savior of mankind. It's not about us. But when we proclaim the truth, church, when we truly love our neighbor from a sincere heart, then God will work powerfully in this community. When we truly come in here to worship and to point all the attention heavenward to him, then God is going to do wonderful things in this community. When we truly proclaim the word of God and don't say, look at me, look at him, look at him, then God's glory will be revealed in this community. God receives the glory. Listen, this Savior is for everybody. That's the story of Christmas I've come to tell you today. God sent his son into the world, not just for the privileged and the well-connected but for the down and outs and the outcasts, those that are made to feel invisible and feel like they're always on the outside looking in at what everybody else, the life they're living. If that's how you've ever felt, I'm here to tell you that this Savior came for you because you matter to God. Not just for the superstars and the homecoming queens, but for those who were overlooked and left out, the ones that didn't get invited. Not just for those who grew up in Christian homes and ha seemed to have it all together and have been in the church for years, but for those who, for whatever reason, found themselves here today, and you don't know why, I'm just going to tell you, there are no coincidences. You're here by the, the sovereign work of God and the Holy Spirit in your life. And I hope that you'll open your heart to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you today. God loves you. You matter to God. He is seeking you. As the good shepherd, he is trying to draw you back to his flock. Not just for those who are stable and, and have all their, their stuff together, but God came looking for those of you who are a hot mess and you know it. You have a checkered past and in a small town like this, people could tell stories about you. But listen, none of that matters because the good shepherd's looking for you. He's been waiting on you to come in and let him restore you to let him rebuild you and build another chapter of the rest of your life. He specializes in it. Oh, it's not a coincidence that you're here today. Please hear the heart of this next verse. I know you know it, but hear it like you're hearing it for the first time. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He started out in a manger, but he ended up on a cross. He gave his only son. Watch this, my favorite part. That... Say this next word with me. Whoever, whoever will believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Maybe you've never thought of yourself as being important, but oh, you are. You are. 
You matter to the God of the universe who created you, who has the blueprints for you laid out in his workroom. You are so important to him. Those shepherds in the field mattered to him. He wanted them there to see the birth of his son. And he wants you here today to hear what you were created for. You were created to live eternally with him. And life is all about figuring out, getting to some point in your journey where you figure out, this is what I was made for, to give my life back to the one who created me, to live in obedience with his, for his will for my life. I love this verse, whosoever believes. I love it because it expresses the heart of God, which is the open arms of Jesus expressed on the cross. And that whoever will come to him, he'll give you eternal life. He'll be your shepherd. He is your lamb who died to take away your sins. You know, when I was younger, I encountered more than one setting where I just didn't feel like I fit in. I didn't find acceptance. In some, it's, it's that I, I wasn't popular enough to fit in in that setting. In some, it might have been, well, your test scores just aren't high enough to, to go to this school or to get acceptance into this. Or you're just not athletic enough to get this award or be a part of, of this team. But listen, the good news of Christmas is that Jesus is for everybody. If you don't remember anything else I've said today, take that home with you. And listen, if you've ever felt unworthy, you've ever felt like, I'm such a mess, why would God want me? Let me tell you something. If you want God, you can rest assured God wants you. You can rest assured of it. And the message of Christmas is that he is pleading while in this age of grace and mercy that we're in, before the arrival of the great lion of Judah, he is begging that all will come through the cross and be made a child of God. He asks that we choose to put our trust in him. Ken Hughes said it this way, and I close with this. The truth is, he says, even if Christ were born in Bethlehem a thousand times, but not within you, you'd be eternally lost. The Christ who was born into the world must be born in your heart. Now listen, Christ has already been born over 2,000 years ago. But we have to come and invite him to be born in our heart. I've asked the worship team if they would come and, and sing this song uh, that I just have thought about all week while I was putting this together. And I want you to take this song home with you too. Let's stand together as we just, if you know it, sing along with them today. But it celebrates what we're talking about. So, you bunch of nobodies. How's that for self-esteem? You are somebody because of him. Amen? That's the story of Christmas. He came to dwell among us to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. And, and there's nobody in here that's good enough on their own. But listen, there's nobody in here that's too dirty with the blood of Jesus that you can't be a child of God. He, he gives it to us as a decision that we make. The fact that Jesus died on the cross means it's possible for everyone to be saved. But it doesn't mean everybody's going to heaven. He's waiting to see what our response is. In the book of Revelation, he gives us a, an analogy. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you'll just open that door, and there's a famous painting of that that's verse... And you'll notice there's no doorknob on the outside. Jesus doesn't force himself into your life. Now, you can let this just be another Christmas where you celebrate the season and the, the tree and the gifts and all that part of it. That's fine. But listen, this could be a Christmas where you celebrate what it's really all about, the Savior of the world who came to be the Lamb of God. He wants to shepherd you through this life, and he wants to be the king of your life for all eternity. Will you accept him in your life today? If you've never done that, I invite you. I don't care if it's the first time you've been here. You've heard the gospel. Will you respond and proclaim Jesus as the Lord of your life? I'll be down here. I'd love to hear that. If that's a decision you'd like to make today. Maybe you need prayer. You can step over here to my left. There's a curtain there. There'll be somebody waiting there to pray with you. If you've got a burden, we don't want you to carry it away from this place today. Okay? If you'd like to be a part of this church family, uh, we, we welcome that decision today as well. Won't you come? Let's stand together. Well, we're already standing. Let's sing our song of invitation. You obey if the Lord's talking to you.